right? I greet you all good morning once again for those who are on social media and uh, uh, to our friends here on Zoom, we greet you in the name of Jesus. I Today, I want to talk about something, uh, uh, I want to share something in the, in the word of God. You know, we have gone through a season, this last one and a half years, we have gone through a period of setting the foundations setting the right pattern, preaching the word so that people can hear. But I believe strongly that we have come to a time, the world is not ready or might not be ready, it doesn't matter. But we are coming to a time or we have come to a time where we need to put or shift the gear to the second gear, which is to build. We have to start building now that the foundations has been laid. And, and, and one of the things during this time and season that you and I will, will, will be seeing or noticing is that, you know, when people get themselves in trouble, when they come to a place where they are facing challenges, they begin to lie about things, I'm talking about people in, 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 in the world. They begin to slander. They begin to manipulate. And sometimes if we are not careful as believers of Jesus Christ, we will fall into the same trap where we begin to lie, we begin to slander, we begin to manipulate. <clears throat> and as I said, we have come to a season or to a place where we need to build. So you and I need to know how to deal with lies and slander. How to overcome. Because in the kingdom, <coughs> excuse me, we don't do things like how the world do, does things. We don't deal with lies and slander like how the world deals with lies and slander. So turn with me to Psalm chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 12. Psalm chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. Verse 1 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King. And my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. For thou art not a God that had pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will uphold the bloody and the deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship towards thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in thy mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sculpture. Sepulchre, sorry. They, are, they flutter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. For they have rebelled against thee. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. 
with favor will thou compass him as with a shield. Now, I want you to understand since the beginning of 2020, right? As, as far as Malaysia is concerned, we can say that since the beginning of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused people fear, or has caused fear among people all over the world. The most dangerous weapon known to humanity, however, is far simpler and more common than the sophisticated nature of the current pandemic. It has destroyed and it has damaged far more people than all the collective pandemics and all the collective weapons of war in human history. It is extremely deadly and each of us possesses it. Right? Now, what weapon am I talking about? that is more deadly than the COVID-19 pandemic. What weapon is that that I'm talking about that is more deadly and damaging and destroying than nuclear weapons and chemical warfare? James chapter three, verse five to eight. James chapter three, verse five to eight says this. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasted great things, Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and had been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. My friends, sinful and self-centered people use words to ruthlessly destroy others. Now, when we, when we are stabbed by slander and lies, Usually we feel helpless to defend ourselves. It is just impossible to know everybody who has heard an untrue rumor or story about us. We do not know who is talking what and saying what. It is even more impossible to control whether they believe it. Sinners enjoy a juicy morsel of gossip and are prone to believe the worst without caring to verify its truth. So what can we do when others slander us? What can we do when others lie about us? Now, Psalm 5 that we just read earlier is a song of lament to the Lord. It is also the first imprecatory psalm. David cries out to God for the destruction of his enemies. I want you to notice this contrast. In Psalm 4, David pleads with his enemies. But in Psalm 5, he pleads against his enemies. Some of your Bibles will have this introductory uh, uh, note in inverted commas, to the chief musician or to the director of music, it indicates that it is, it is intended for the use in the congregation. And it's supposed to be accompanied by flutes. So in this prayer of David, the Holy Spirit, the great inspirer of scripture, shows us what to do when we are lied about and when we are slandered. It stands as a, as a timeless pattern. Remember I told you this season, we got to follow the pattern of the kingdom of God. We got to realign ourselves 
and pattern ourselves according to the will of God. And this scripture, this portion of scripture stands as a timeless pattern for us to follow as long as we live in a wicked, sin-cursed world. And this is how to deal with lies and slander. Now let's look at Psalm 5, verse 1 to 3. Once again, let's look at it one more time. Verse 1 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shall thou hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. The first point I'm trying to make is this. The first step in dealing with lies and slander is to turn to the Lord for help. The first step in dealing with lies and slander is to turn to the Lord for help. Instead of rushing to defend himself throughout the kingdom, instead of attacking his enemies who were his fellow countrymen, David called upon the Lord to deliver him from his critical situation. He beseeched God to deal with those who were lying about him. Both David and his enemies were, were, were Israelites. They were citizens of God's chosen nation and children of the covenant. Why should the Lord listen to David over his enemies? So David's basis for expecting God to help him rather than his enemies is revealed in the first three verses of this psalm. Now, when turning to God for help, ask God to hear your words. Ask God to hear your sighings. Ask God to hear your cry for help. That's the first step. That's the first thing we do. When we turn to God to ask him for help, ask him to hear your words. Ask him to, to, to hear your sighings and, and ask him to hear your cry for help. Now, in the case of David, as we see, vicious lies about the king were flying throughout Jerusalem because Absalom's first plan of attack was carefully strategized war of words. David's rebellious son charmed potential followers with flattering words, who in turn spread false rumors about the king to their friends and associates. David realized he was powerless to quench the vicious tongues of his foes. So he told his side of the story to the only one who could help him. <coughs> he didn't go out and tell stories to everybody, but he only told the story to the one who could help him. And the one who could help him was the Lord. Meditation or sighing literally means murmur or whisper. Now I want you to, to imagine this. Israel was buzzing with the murmuring of deceived followers of Absalom who whispered accusations against their king. But in contrast, the godly slandered king whispered only in the ears of the Lord. Consider means to separate mentally. David called upon God to discern between what was being said about him and the truth. The next point is this. When turning to God for help, the second step is to submit to the Lord as your king and your God. When you turn to God for help, you have to submit to the Lord as your king and your God. David's frustration and desperation are apparent in his words to the Lord. The people were listening to Absalom's murmuring supporters. But David pled with the Lord to listen to his voice rather than theirs. He claims God's attention by announcing his allegiance and submission to him. The king of Israel bowed himself before his king and his God. I want you to take note that David 
address God as Elohim. Elohim means the strong, the powerful one, the one whose might exceeds, exceeds all others. David called upon his king to use his power to overcome those who are trying to destroy him with venomous lies. David also appealed to God on the basis of his faithful obedience to him. The Lord was his God. He sought the Lord's attention and assistance because he believed the promise revealed in God's law. The Lord will help those who obey his commandments. We find this in Deuteronomy 27, verse 16 to 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11 to 20. So as David would shortly point out, God destroys liars and deceivers. In contrast, David lived in submission to God and his statutes. It is important to understand, my friends, that David did not speak as a man who felt he held, he held claim to God's blessings. He did not sound like as though God was obligated to help him. His attitude was that of one who was confident in the sincerity and holiness of his walk with God. In the midst of his crisis, David wanted to act only in obedience and submission to God. Instead of directing his distraught emotions towards his foes, he poured them out to the Lord. Unlike his enemies, he did not want to react in any way that displeased God. So the slandered king refused to retaliate by returning evil for evil. But he submitted himself to God and he committed the handling of the situation to God. The third step when turning to God for help, the third step is to seek God in the morning. You know, verse 3 mentions this twice, seeking God in the morning. David was faithful in his fellowship with the Lord. In fact, he began each day in prayer. Unlike so many people, he did not speak with the Lord only when he was in distress. He did not speak to the Lord only when he was desperate for something. But David was a daily visitor to the throne of grace. Morning prayer is so significant that is mentioned twice in this verse. Why is it so important? Firstly, prayer in the morning recognizes God as the greatest priority of our lives. Before God met David or before David met with anyone else, before David, because he was the king and he was meeting people every day, but before he met anyone else, he first met with the Lord. Before he tended to any of the day's affairs or business, he first sought the Lord in prayer. The first appointment on his daily calendar was with God. So prayer at the beginning of the day acknowledges God as the most important being in our lives. Secondly, morning prayer is important because it recognizes God as the greatest power in our lives. Every day, David's first activity was to direct his voice to the Lord in prayer. In Hebrew, the word direct or lay means to set in order, to arrange, to place in a row. It is the word used for laying wood in an orderly fashion for a sacrifice, arranging the pieces of a sacrifice on the altar, the setting of the showbread in orderly rows on the tabernacle table, so in the same orderly way, David laid out his prayers, his praise, his request and commitments to the Lord every morning. He petitioned the Lord for his needs. He looked up to the Lord as the only one 
who could supply his needs. He waited in expectation for God to answer and to bestow everything he needed throughout the day. Wisdom, strength, protection, material provision, patience, courage, guidance, grace, and victory. I want us to think about this this morning. The wise person is able to discern when and when not to answer a fool. That's what Proverbs 26 verse 4 to 5 tells us. If we fight back against people who lie about us, we risk sinking to their level. It is often best to turn the matter over to the Lord as David did and to simply continue to do right, to stand in truth and righteousness, rather to stand against our opposition. Pastors and other leaders must especially discern when to publicly respond to unjust criticism and untrue accusations. Right? I say pastors and leaders. All of us are leaders as a believer. We must know when to discern. We must, we must discern when to publicly respond to an unjust criticism or to an untrue accusation. Nehemiah set a good example for God's servants to follow. He refused to come down from the great work he was doing to battle his critics. They were trying to draw him into a debate, into an argument for an unholy purpose, to provoke him to react wrongly, which would give them greater accusations against him. But as God's servants, we must be wise to the ways of Satan and those who follow his promptings. We must be carefully or we must carefully guard ourselves from saying or doing anything that would harm us and our effectiveness for the Lord. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus says this. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, I also mentioned this earlier. And I want to just get a bit more deeper in. Morning. Morning prayer. Morning is a strategically crucial time for prayer. There are two men who have given quotations or quoted about morning prayer. One is Matthew Henry. These are all uh, Bible commented commentators. Matthew Henry says, morning prayer is our duty. We are the fittest for prayer when we are in the most fresh and lively and composed frame, got clear of the slumbers of the night, revived by them, and not yet filled with the business of the day. We have then most need of prayer, considering the dangers and temptations of the day to which we are exposed, and against which we are concerned by faith and prayer to fetch, to fetch in fresh supplies of grace. That's what Matthew Henry says. Hallelujah. I want to look at verse 4 to 6 of Psalm 5. Verse 4 to 6. For thou art not a God that had pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak pleasing. The Lord will uphold the bloody and the deceitful man. The second step in dealing with lies and slander is to confess God's holiness. After citing his faithfulness or after citing his faithful relationship with the Lord, David appealed to God's righteous character as the basis for giving attention to his request. He listed five facts 
of God's holiness. He listed five facts of God's virtues that his enemies were violating. In doing so, David implicitly distinguishes himself from the sinners who are not heard by the Lord. Five facts about God or five virtues of God's holiness. Firstly, he says, God takes no pleasure in evil. God takes no pleasure in evil. Consider how far removed from God we are as sinful humans. The righteous character of God cannot delight in wickedness. Not even in a single act of evil behavior. The evil referred to in this psalm is the sin of slandering others, gossiping and spreading rumors about them. People who lie about others actually receive some perverted pleasure from their wicked deeds. It gives them a sense of being superior. It gives them a sense of being better than the person being degraded or slandered. It arouses a sense of satisfaction in their corrupt, depraved natures. Secondly, second virtue of God is that God rejects the wicked and arrogant. He does not allow them to live in, in his presence. God's holiness cannot tolerate any presence of sin whatsoever. Sinners cannot enter into his presence. When the Bible says foolish, you know, foolish, the word foolish in, in, in the Hebrew is halal. Nothing to do with food. Right? Foolishness here, it, it means to make to shine, to praise, to boast. Other versions translate it to be boastful, proud, and arrogant. It is the sin of Satan who exalted himself above God. Pride is the sin that tops the list of the seven abominations against the Lord. Thirdly, the third virtue of God. God hates all wrongdoers. I'm basing this on the scripture we read. Psalm 5 verse 5 says that God hates all wrongdoers. Some people struggle with the statement that God hates evildoers. They do not understand how God can hate somebody, especially in light of the New Testament teaching that denounces hatred and likens it to murder. We must be understood in, uh, uh, what must be understood is this. God's hatred of sin and, and sinners is not an uncontrolled emotional response. The hatred of God is not an irrational outburst. But God's moral response to our immorality or here to those who do evil, God's heartfelt emotion towards sinners is love. Love that was demonstrated in the sacrifice of his son for our sins. Hatred is the response of his righteous character towards sin. The response of his holy nature against those who continue in rebellion against him. The fourth character of God. God destroys the liar. God destroys the liar. The lying tongue is second only to the proud demeanor on God's list of most hated sins. Leasing is an old English word, is an old English word for lie or falsehood. God so distressed lying because we are never more like Satan than when we lie. Especially when we lie about others. Remember, Satan is a liar and the father of all lies. He constantly levels false accusations against God. And he slanders the sons and daughters of God. The fifth virtue of God is God abhors the deceitful. Bloody or bloodthirsty and deceitful are tied together in this verse. They jointly describe a person who violently destroy other people by spreading lies about them. A deceiver dupes others into turning against another person or another group of people. The deceitful attack the innocent. They devise wicked stories. They stir up mischief. 
They bear false witness for the purpose of sowing discord and hurting other people. I want you to think about these things this morning, my friends. In our efforts to share the love of God for sinners, we must be careful not to diminish God's attributes of holiness and righteousness. The wrath of God has been clearly revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, against all ungodliness of people. God, through his boundless love, has made it possible for sinners to be saved from his wrath. But we must believe, we must repent, we must receive Christ in order to be delivered from the wages of sin. If we do not believe, we will suffer death. Romans 6.23 tells us that. Now this does not refer to a physical death, but it refers to a spiritual death, an eternal separation for God, from God in hell. The contrast to eternal life with the Father. In the great book of Revelation, as God's message to humanity comes to an end, the redeemed are seen eternally dwelling with God in a new heaven and new earth. But immediately prior to these chapters is a terrifying, sobering scene. All the unrighteous dead, those who have not been made righteous, those who have not been justified through faith in Jesus Christ, are resurrected to stand before God in judgment. They are tried and convicted for their sins. Then they are cast into the lake of fire for eternity. My friends, as we share God's love with sinners, we also must be reminded, or we must also remind them of God's holiness, of God's righteousness, that cannot be compromised when dealing with sin. Romans 1 verse 18, Paul tells the Roman church this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Let's go back to Psalm 5 verse 7. Psalm 5 verse 7. It says that, but as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship towards thy holy temple. The third step in dealing with lies and slander is to make a renewed commitment to be faithful in prayer and worship. David sharply contrasted himself with the evildoers of whom he had spoken. He had already declared the fact that he was faithful in worshiping the Lord daily in verse 3. And now he presents himself anew before his king and before his God. He makes a renewed commitment to be faithful in prayer and worship. Now, the few things I want you to note. When making a renewed commitment to be faithful in prayer and worship, the first step is to approach God through his mercy seat. It is only through God's mercy that we have access to him. Mercy is God's unfailing, steadfast love. His unmerited favor and devotion to us. This trait of God steers, it, it steers God to offer his covenant to us and to unfailingly keep his covenant with us. We may fail the Lord, but he never fails us. Mercy is one of his attributes, one of his qualities that reveals his unparalleled character. God is not stingy with his mercy. His house is filled with his steadfast love. It is more than sufficient to cover our sin. So David made a promise to the Lord. When he returned to Jerusalem, he would again come into God's house. He would once again come into the tabernacle, the place where God's holy presence dwelt. If the setting of this psalm is Absalom's rebellion, this is a great statement of faith in God's deliverance. David had fled from Jerusalem into the wilderness. Before the battle against Absalom's forces ever began, he committed himself to worship the Lord 
after the victory had been born, after the, the victory had been won, he said, I will come and I will present myself in praise and worship. I want you to note two significant facts. First, David pledged to be faithful in worship was an acknowledgement that victory over such impossible odds could come only through the Lord. It would be faithfulness. The Lord's faithfulness. His covenant promises that would make God's dear servant victorious. Secondly, although David refers to his faithfulness in his prayer, he acknowledged that it would be God's mercy that delivered him. Not his own righteousness. Not his own righteousness. But God's mercy. When making a renewed commitment to be faithful in prayer and worship, the second step is to be reverent. David made an unusual commitment to the Lord. While he was in the wilderness, when he worshipped, he would bow down and pray in the direction of the Lord's holy temple or dwelling place. In reverence, in fear of the Lord, he would bow down towards Jerusalem. Fear is the reverential awe, the recognition of who God is. An attitude that results in submissive obedience to God and his word. David recommitted himself to walk humbly before the Lord during the time that he was forced out of Zion. I want you to note these few things. Confronting overwhelming odds, David offered himself as a living sacrifice to the Lord. He prayed and trust, trusted God for victory. But at the same time, he was fully aware that God could choose otherwise. My friends, God often grants victory to his faithful people. But he sometimes chooses that they suffer for his glory. It is great faith that believes God for the victory, but it's greater faith that is devoted enough to trust and worship God in the midst of suffering and trial, to submit even to death if God should choose. David demonstrated this kind of faith and commitment. This is the kind of faith that you and I must have as well. When God for his purposes chooses not to deliver us from some trial, we must still trust in him. When he gives and when he takes away, we must still bless his name. We must trust him and glory in the strength he gives to endure the trials that confront us. God is always true to himself and to his dear children. If we love him, he will work all things together for our good. Psalm 5, verse 8 to 12. Psalm 5, verse 8 to 12. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor will thou compass him as with a shield. The fourth step in dealing with lies and slander is to pray for three major things. Three major things. Now, although David realized that God could allow his defeat, he fervently prayed for God to deliver him and his royal followers from Absalom's army. In these verses, David charges his enemies with being guilty of many sins, sins that God despises. Now, I want you to note a few things. The first major thing to pray for is to pray for God's guidance. 
Pray for God's guidance that God will lead you in righteousness. When facing overwhelming trouble, some major decisions always have to be made. David knew this, and David feared making a wrong decision. Therefore, he earnestly asked God to lead him according to his righteousness. The king realized that God had a way, God had a path, God had a road for him to travel through this crisis. He needed God to make that way straight, to clear it of all obstacles. He wanted nothing to prevent him from seeing the way clearly and following it. These obstacles included his own desires, his own emotions, and any ungodly counsel he might receive from others. Now, King David, like a prosecuting attorney, presented his closing argument against his enemies in verse 9 of Psalm 5. He employed four terms that describe the entire process of their lying. David paints a crude picture, but it accurately represents the sin of slander. Firstly, every word that proceeded from their mouth was a lie. That's what David said. Nothing they said was faithful, true, reliable, or trustworthy. Secondly, they were inwardly corrupt. Inward part or heart refers to it, to it, in the Greek, it refers to the internal organs. That means their destructive lies proceeded from hearts that overflowed with deadly poison. Thirdly, these poisonous lies travel up their throats into their mouths. And their throats is described as an open and unsealed tomb or grave. One that is foul and allows the stench of decay of death to be released into the air. And lastly, when this putrid uh, poison reached their mouth, their smooth tongues deceptively twisted, twisted it into flattery. This was Absalom's method of gaining support and turning the people away from David. The second major thing to pray, the second major thing to pray for is to pray for God's justice. That God declare the wicked guilty, let them fall and, ban let, and banish them. David called upon God. He called upon the Elohim the all-powerful, almighty one, to return a guilty verdict against his wicked foes. Destroy is better translated as guilty here. Right? The primary meaning of the word ashram seems to center on guilt, but moves from the act which brings guilt to the condition of guilt to the act of punishment. David specifically prayed for God's retribution. Retribution. That he execute justice by allowing his force to perish by their own counsels, their own evil plans and devices. He prayed that they would fall into the trap they had set for him, that they would hang on their own gallows, that they would perish by their own swords. God sometimes executes this kind of ironic justice as in the case of the wicked Haman who sought to exter exterminate the Jews. David used the same descript descriptive word of his enemy's sins, multitude, that he used God's mercy. He beseeched God to cast them out. He, he beseeched God to banish them from the kingdom of Israel and from his presence. Their transgressions and rebellion were not against him as king, but against the Lord and his eternal plan. That is, the Lord had appointed David to the throne of Israel, and he had also determined that the Messiah would one day establish his kingdom and rule from David's throne. Absalom's revolt against his father was a revolt against God and his sacred, and his sacred plan. The second major thing to pray for is to pray, sorry, the third major thing to pray for is to pray for God's protection and blessing. 
David concluded his prayer by interceding for the faithful people of Israel who were unswayed by Absalom's charm and charisma. They were not relying on their own strength or weapons, for they were severely outnumbered and stood no chance against such, in summer, such a total amount of, of odds. But they had one resource that could deliver them. They had one resource that could save them, and that's the Lord. This small band of faithful followers were totally depending upon the Lord to protect them. The words put their trust means to take refuge or to flee for protection. They had no shelter in the wilderness. Only God could protect and deliver them. These were the people who loved the Lord's great and holy name. They stood in distinct contrast to those who were rebelling against God. The Lord's name represents his character. Jehovah is the God who makes and keeps covenant. The one who is faithful to his word. The rebels had risen up against God's covenant with David. The embattled king entreated the Lord for three blessings upon these faithful people. Three blessings David prayed for for these faithful people. For those who are faithful to David. First, that God will let them rejoice and be glad. Second, that God will allow them to sing for joy because he had personally risen to their defense. And thirdly, that they would have cause to rejoice, not in their victory, but in him, the God whose great name they loved. I want you to take note of the king's confidence in the midst of his crisis. Of his crisis. He was sure the Lord would be true to his character. He would surely bless those who stood in righteousness. God's favor would cover them like a shield. The Lord will completely surround them and protect them from their enemies. I want us to note these things down today. We must not miss the message of this great psalm. It provides a pattern for us when we are lied about and slandered. Firstly, we seek the Lord's guidance. Do not stray from the path of righteousness, my friends, by reacting wrongly against your enemies. Ask the Lord to lead you every step of the way. Submit your will and emotions to the control of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, do not speak to retaliate against your enemies, but commit the carrying out of justice to the Lord. God can be trusted to take care of them. Thirdly, examine your heart and life. Examine your faithfulness to the Lord and his commands. If you are unfaithful in any area of life, confess it to God and repent of it. The righteous will be blessed and favored by the Lord. Be sure your life is, the, is one that he can bless. Then trust God to protect you and vindicate you. The victory may not come immediately. But in God's timing, our lying enemies will be exposed and defeated. They will often fall by their own hands. The hypocrisy and wickedness of their lives will be eventually displayed and seen by all. We must trust the Lord. We must rest in him. We must continue to do good. It is often the process of time that tells the truth. Over the long term, the faithful and their families are established and blessed. The ungodly are fully exposed and driven away in God's justice. You know, I, I want to close this message with Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 to 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 to 21, where it says, Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst, give him a drink. For in so doing, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, 
but overcome with evil with good. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, for reminding us of the importance, the importance of how to deal with our enemies. Give us the strength, Lord, to forgive. Give us the strength, Lord, to even surrender their wrongdoings into your hands, Lord, whose vengeance is yours. Father, even in areas where we have fallen short, we pray for your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, that you forgive us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you strengthen us as we realign ourselves to your pattern, the kingdom pattern, as we build on it, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. Father, we pray that you increase our faith even this week. Increase our faith. We thank you for protection. We thank you for provision this week. We thank you, Lord, for supplying all our needs according to the riches of your glory. We thank you, Lord, for a deeper walk with you this week. And we thank you, Lord, that although no matter how rough how tough, how rough the roots and the pathway may be that you're always with us. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm. I just want to bring an exhortation to you. You know, listening to what uh, Dr. Chris has has spoken, we must be reminded that we are walking in very crucial times. We know that the pandemic is raging. Many have gone home to be with the Lord. People whom we love, people whom we have journeyed with, brothers and sisters in Christ, servants of the Lord. Many people are not here anymore people who have journeyed with us. But all we can say is this. This is a time that God wants us to rise up being his church. This is a time that we ought to learn to renew our minds and get it transformed. This is a time when we ought to be looking at how we can become the true church of Jesus in this time and season. Is it, you know, about uh, slandering and, uh, you know, talking about all kinds of things that is important? Is that what the Lord is speaking to us in this day and season? But I believe that in this day and season, that we ought to be looking at what James spoke. He said, confess your faults to one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There might be people who have slandered us and hurt us and persecuted us. But isn't that the mark of the believer in, this, in, in our walk with the Lord? Isn't that the mark of the true believer? That we are a persecuted lot and that is what we are actually. But do we take all these persecutions and throw back darts at people? Or do we rise up to confess our faults to one another so that we can be healed? And as we pray, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And in this season, how effective is our prayer for those who do not know God? How effective is our prayer that our prayer can rise up to be incensed into the throne room of God? How effective can that prayer be? We are called to be the salt and the light of the earth. We are called to be the beacon of light and to bring that exhortation to the, the, those who are dying, to those who do not know God. Are we there to, to just you know, uh, uh, to, to bring that kind of a, what you call, 
not just slandering. You know, sometimes it's, it's just not wanting to reach out. Are we not willing to reach out? Isn't that the call of the church in this day and time? What are we to do? So I bring this exhortation to you. You are called to be the righteous church, not the unrighteous church. Mm. You are called to reach. You are called to forgive. You are called to stay strong so that we can be healed. We need to look at some important perspectives that is in God's heart. Are we aligned to the things that God has in his heart? So let's look at that and rise up to be a mighty church in Malaysia, for Malaysia. The Malaysia will be mighty once again. With that, we bless you. With that, we wish you a happy, a blessed Sunday. Stay strong and mighty. Amen. Amen. So for our uh, Facebook and social media, we're going to switch it off. We'll see you all next week. For those of you on Zoom, please hang, please hold on. <laughs>